make test ENV up, make test, make test ENV down. It's three commands. It's three commands when I go to work with a new testing, a new group in our, uh, a new team in our company to show them how to run the test environment. Make test ENV up, make test, make test ENV down. It's three commands when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a developer who just put their code into the repository only to find out that the build is now broken. We get in on their computer, and we run these three commands. Make test ENV up, make test, make test ENV down. For a lot of people, when you get into running Selenium, I can't, tell them, I can't tell my teams that in order to reproduce an error on their computer, that they have to go through a page worth of instructions just so that they can uh, build the, uh, get the prerequisites for running the Selenium test cases on their own system. You guys know what it's like. It's probably easiest to get started running Selenium by using a browser that is already installed on your own computer. Then you need to choose a programming language. A lot of people choose Java. Java is a great programming language. I happen to use Linux on my system. After a while, I might get a couple of JREs installed in there. And Java, can't be, I can't figure out which one to use. So I end up using Python a lot of the times. But Python has its own problems. It's kind of going through an identity crisis right now, right? You got people in the Python 2 camp, you got people in the Python 3 camp, people are moving in between, trying to convert over. So if you install Python, you also have to worry about installing modules that will uh, upgrade or downgrade your system modules. Right? So people say, oh, well, install your Python modules in a virtual ENV. The next thing you have to worry about is browser drivers. You want to run the Firefox or the Chrome uh, browser, you have to install browser drivers on your system. Right? And the browser manufacturers are doing a great job of putting together these drivers that are matching up with the uh, web driver specification. But when you install your driver, you have to make sure that your driver matches the version of the web browser. Another thing you have to watch out for is make sure that Selenium can find your driver or else you'll get an error that looks like this. So after you do all this work, you're going to be up and ready, run, ready to run your Selenium test on your computer. But you're probably not working alone, right? You're working with a friend. So you're going to have to help them get this Selenium stuff set up on their computer. Make sure you guys are running the same programming language, the same version of the language, the same browser versions, that kind of thing. Stuff is installed in the same locations. And then once the word gets out that you're the person who knows how to install Selenium, <laughs> you're going to be helping out with the whole team. And if you guys are running in continuous integration, congratulations. You're now in charge of that, too. So for a small team that's trying to get up and running, working with Selenium uh, test cases, they can either go through all this or it has to be as simple as these three commands. Make test ENV up, make test, make test ENV down. My name is Derek Kearney, and these are some of the issues that I had to face as I, went, as I joined a new project recently. And so today I'd like to tell you about the different, about some of the reasons why I choose to share with the, with the groups that I work with these three test commands, these three simple commands. Now, I don't want to, it's not a panacea, you know. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes with these commands. But I'm going to walk through you, with you each command to show you what's happening. And then we'll talk about some common questions that uh, come up with running these three commands. So on the command line, the first command that we run is make test env up. This test brings up your test environment. So at the very least, we know we're going to need some web browsers. Lucky for us, 
the, Do the Selenium project has been putting together Docker containers that hold web browsers inside of them. If you're not familiar with Docker, you can think of it as a, a, in a small environment where you can run a single process that's isolated from other processes on your computer. So on the, doc, on the Selenium website, you can find Docker images for uh, standalone Selenium containers uh, with web browser installed and the driver already installed for you. All you have to do is download the image and start using it. My teams chose to go with the Selenium grid node and hub configuration. So these are two Docker images, one of them with the Selenium grid hub, the other one with the Selenium grid node. And when the hub, when you bring those up, you now have a Selenium grid installed on your computer that you can use. You don't have to install anything else. Now, if you're not familiar with Selenium grid, you can think about it as a browser allocation service. Right? So your program will request a browser from the Selenium grid process. Your program will tell it, hey, I want a browser that's running on this operating system or this version of a browser or this type of a browser. And if that browser is available through the Selenium grid, then it will provide you, it will make the connection between your program and that browser, and you'll have a browser that's up and running ready for you. One of the reasons we like Docker containers so much is because uh, you can reliably reproduce the environment. So we can take, those, uh, we can take a configuration for a Docker container, and we can share it with other people and have them build that environment on their computer, and it will run almost the same way as it runs on your computer. We take our Selenium grid configuration and we store it inside of a Docker Compose file so that we can launch the Selenium grid with one command, Docker Compose command, and then when we want to tear down the, the system, we can tear it down with a single command as well. So, what else is in our, our test environment? If you have a web application, you might be running that web application in a Docker container. So we can bring that up with our make test env up command as well. And if that web application has additional uh, support containers, we can bring those up all as part of our make test env up command. So the make test env up command is really bringing up our whole environment. The second command, make test. Make test is responsible for running the test cases. So in this case, we're going to launch another Docker container, and we'll call it the test runner environment. It's an environment that has all the software that's needed in order to run the test cases. Inside of the test runner environment that we use, we install Python. So we have a Python 3 interpreter. We have a debugger, we have Selenium libraries, and we have a couple of uh, shell script, uh, uh, bash shell commands, and curl and wget for debugging stuff. We also include this thing called a test runner. Our teams are using the PyTest test runner. And one of the reasons I like PyTest is because it gives us enough hooks to get in and inject data into a test case and collect information on test cases uh, as they're running. So all of the test, the test runner, all that stuff runs inside of this test runner environment. The test runner is responsible for collecting test cases and then executing the test cases one by one. When a test case needs a new browser, it will contact our Selenium grid that's running on the same Docker network as all the rest of our containers. And the, the browser, the new web browser will be allocated. And because our, our test runner environment is running on the same Docker network as the, other test as the other containers, it can also contact our web application and the other uh, support systems. After the test runner has finished, after all the test cases have completed, the test runner will output two files, the first one being a result .xml file, which contains uh, output from the test session, 
So whether tests passed or failed, and a little bit of timing information about those tests. This is a JUnit style XML file. And the second file it outputs is a, uh, a log file, which contains the standard output from the test run. When the test, when PyTest, uh, when the PyTest process completes, the test runner container is shut down, and we're ready for our third command: make test env down. The make test env down command shuts down all of the containers that were started by the make test env up command. So with these three commands, somebody can go through and get started with running our test environment. So let me go through this one more time, just in case you blinked. We start off with the test env up command. It launches your test environment, all of the services that are needed in order to run your test cases. Next, we launch the, the we run the make test command. The make test command launches a Docker container for our test runner environment. Our test runner, PyTest, is collecting all the test cases, running through the test cases, and when it's done, it outputs two files a results.xml file with the, with the status of each test case, and then also a standard output for the uh, standard output for the uh, PyTest. And when we're finished, we run make test env down to shut down the whole system. Now, it's only three commands because this, this system uses a lot of the software that our developers and our, uh, and our QA people already have on their system for, building, uh, for doing development, right? If you think about the commands that we just went through, there's really two, two classifications of, of uh, requirements here, or dependencies. The first one is that you'll need to have bash and core utils and make command on your computer. So bash and core utils, core utilities, they usually come with uh, most operating systems that I've seen. You don't have to do anything special to get those installed. You might have to uh, do, you might have to install something extra in order to get make. The second piece are the Docker containers. So Docker and Docker compose commands. These two commands, a lot of people usually have them on their system if they're doing development, but if you don't, you can go to the Docker website and download those two executables. Now, one more thing I want to talk about is you might see that we're running our commands with the make or we're running our commands with the make program. So make, you might be familiar with make as a program for building executables. But you can think about it as a generalized uh, command execution program, right? So you tell it a recipe, and it will, create, it will run the, the commands for that recipe. It uses a make file, or a file called make file, in order to uh, read the commands. So we store our commands inside of make file. At the top of the make file, you'll notice that there are a bunch of variables, and then the rest of the file will be uh, different recipes or collections of commands that you can run. So if we look at our commands, we have the make test env up command, which calls into the uh, make file. It looks for a target called test env up. And this target is actually calling another target called grid up. And down below in grid up, you'll see that it's running the docker compose command to bring up our selenium grid. So similarly, with the make test command, we're calling the test target, which runs a bunch of commands, but you'll see, you can see that it's running a docker run command, and then it's also running uh, pytest, which is our, our test runner command. So if you're using make files as your build system, you can take these, uh, these recipes and just stick them into your own make file. If you're using another build system, then these kinds of recipes can probably translate over to your build system. But if you're not using a build system at all, you might consider using make. Now, after I've told 
people about these commands. We get them running on their system. They're amazed that, uh, that it was so simple to get up and running. After the excitement dies down, they start to ask the hard questions. Right? So one of the questions I get is, how do you view the browsers as you're running the tests? Right? You might have remembered that we were launching our web browsers inside of Docker containers. Well, the Selenium project has a set of Docker containers that have, or Docker images, that have this ending, this suffix of dash debug. And those images have a VNC server running inside of them. So VNC stands for Virtual Network Computing. And, you, and it's like a little uh, remote desktop program, so you can connect to it through a VNC viewer. And so the easy way of connecting to, this, uh, to starting up the VNC viewers is to use a little program called ShowNode. So after you've run make test env up, you can use the show node program in order to launch your VNC viewers. So show node is going to be, you'll, you can find a copy in the repository that I'll have the link at the end of the presentation. But it's just a little program that looks through all your Docker containers and looks for things that look like VNC servers and then tries to connect to them. Now, if there's an easy way, then there's probably a hard way. And the hard way is to use the docker ps command. If you don't want to use show node, you can use the docker ps command directly. You can figure out which port is running uh, the, the, the VNC server. And then if you're on Linux, you can use VNC viewer program in order to uh, launch your VNC viewer. If you're on Mac OS, you can use the open command. Next question, how do you go about debugging test cases? These things are running in Docker containers. I have to interact with it through a VNC viewer. It seems hard. But really, it's the same way that you would do it on your normal computer. So because our test cases are written in Python, we can use the normal ways of, of debugging programs in Python. So inside of your code, we'll add a line called import PDB for the Python debugger. And then we'll say PDB dot set underbar trace. And then on the command line, we'll launch our show node program, which will bring up a VNC viewer. We'll then run the make test command to start running our test cases. And we can pass some arguments into the PyTest test runner so we can filter out all the test cases we don't want to run, or we can filter the test case we do want to run using the minus K option. So in this case, we're going to run the test valid login test case. And then when your program gets to the line of code where you've enacted, enabled the, the, the trace, you'll be dropped off into the debugger right inside of your terminal. And from there, you can use your normal Python debugger commands in order to interact with the web browser. You can step through each command and see what's happening inside the web browser. Next question I usually get is, how do you write new test cases? Seems kind of hard because we're working inside of this environment that isn't our normal computer, right? I always get started by starting my test environment with a flag called debug equals one. Inside my make file, I have that flag set up so that it will, uh, it will prevent the Selenium grid from shutting down inactive web browsers. And sometimes when I'm debugging in a long debugging session, I don't want my browser shutting down in the middle of me doing my debugging. Next thing I do, is I run the show node command so that I can launch a VNC viewer and I can see the web browser as, a, as I'm debugging. And then I run the make run command. Now, I know I told you it was only three commands before, but here's a fourth one. Make run is very similar to make test. The difference is that make test will only run your test runner, whereas make run, you can say run any command, right? So any command that's inside of the Docker container, inside of our development Docker container, you can run it. So inside of our Docker container, we have a Python interpreter. So my make run command, 
I'm going to launch my, my Python interpreter. And then in my terminal, I'll be dropped off inside of a Python a terminal interpreter, and I can start using my regular Selenium commands in order to, uh, in order to load libraries and interact with a web browser. In my case, I use the, a, a library called Selene, which is a lightweight wrapper around a lot of the Selenium commands for the Python uh, language bindings. And it allows me to write code that is uh, a little more stable than my normal, my normal Selenium code ends up being. So from within the, within the interpreter, I can ask for a remote web browser by using web, webdriver.remote. I point it to my Selenium grid, my local Selenium grid that's running in the Docker containers, because remember, we're inside of a Docker container right now with this interpreter. It's on the same network as the rest of our, um, our test environment. So we can directly access the Selenium grid that's also on that Docker network. And then I share my driver uh, object with the Selene library so that I can start using Selene commands to, uh, to automate my web browser. All right, oh, one more thing. At this point, I can go in with my mouse and keyboard and interact with the web browser that's running inside the VNC viewer. Right? So just like you would normally interact with a web browser that's running on your, on your computer, on your desktop, you can interact with uh, the mouse and keyboard events will make it through the VNC over to the, over to the uh, Docker container. All right, so once I have my test, uh, I know which locators I, wanna, uh, I, wanna, I want to uh, interact with, and I know uh, which commands I want to run, then I, I can take those same commands and, and translate them over to a testing script. So at the top of my testing script, I'm going to load in my Selene library. And then inside of my script, I'm going to write a function, just taking the same commands that I've had in my interpreter and placing them into a test function. Now, there's three things about this function that I think are worth pointing out. The first one is that you'll notice that we didn't launch a web browser anywhere. There was no webdriver.remote function called. And that's because there's a fixture that is providing the web browser for us. So, PyTest has a number of plugins. One of them that I found very useful is the PyTest Selenium plugin. And you can use that to take care of some of the boilerplate code that you would normally put inside of your test case. So our driver, uh, our driver variable here is provided by the, Sele the, the uh, PyTest Selenium plugin. Second thing to notice is that we have these S functions. And these are coming from the Selene library. The S function is similar to, uh, Py, uh, to, the, um, to the Selenium find element by CSS selector, but it has one important difference, I would say. With PyTest, uh, excuse me, with, uh, with the S function, when you perform a search for, or when you uh, call the S function, you're not actually performing a search for the element. The search is actually delayed. S returns back what I refer to as a, the lazy representation of an element, meaning that you get an object with the locator stored inside, but the search for the, uh, for the element is not performed until, you, until you, uh, you perform an action on the element. Right? And so this, uh, this kind of uh, setup This kind of setup uh, uh, means that if, you, uh, uh, if your element is not on the web page at the time when you uh, start to do your call, it will, it will do an explicit wait and wait for the element to show up. And if after that uh, wait time has, if, it, if after the time is timed out, then you'll get a, a timeout exception. And, um, 
you'll get a timeout exception. And, uh, if, and if, you, if, if the element has showed up, then you won't get the timeout exception. The action will be performed. So the third thing worth uh, noting on this, uh, in this test is that assertions in Selene are performed through the should and should not functions. So if an assertion, is, um, if an assertion comes out as correct or uh, as true, then, or if an assertion comes out as false, then a screenshot will be taken of the uh, web page and an exception will be raised. So that's more code that I, didn't have to, I wouldn't have to normally write inside of my test case. All right, another question I usually get is how do I set this up in continuous integration, right? If you're a small team and you're working on, and you, you don't have a, a large Selenium grid available to you, then you may be thinking to yourself, I, I don't want to maintain a large Selenium grid. Uh, how can I get this working in, in, in something like Jenkins? Well, inside of your Jenkins file, you can run the same three commands that we were running locally. Make test env up, make test, and make test env down. A lot of uh, continuous integration systems have the ability to uh, store results, so you'll probably want to save all the screenshots, all of the uh, results.xml files, and all of the log files. In Jenkins, there's a plugin called JUnit plugin. And with the JUnit plugin, you can hand it a JUnit style XML file with test results, and it will display it for you inside of, uh, inside of your build. So you can easily tell which uh, tests failed, which tests passed, and all the timing information for those tests. Another plugin that I found useful is the PyTest test groups plugin. So if you, uh, if you want to uh, try out running test cases in parallel, you can start by uh, checking out this plugin. The idea behind the plugin is that if you have a large collection of test cases, you can split them up into small test groups, and then inside of Jenkins, you can start multiple nodes in order to uh, run those test cases. So each one will have its own Selenium grid. It's kind of a, uh, a, a, a cheap way of running uh, tests in parallel. And the, the, uh, for that particular plugin, you'll also need to add in some uh, command line options for PyTest. So you can hand those in through your Jenkins, um, inside of your Jenkins file by using the PyTest options make file variable. If you're, as your group is expanding and as you have more needs for building test cases or, and for running them in CI, you might ask, is there a way that I can send my uh, test cases out to uh, some other kind of grid, right? And there's lots of people building grids out there. One project that uh, you guys may have heard about is the Zelenium project. Uh, they gave a present, Diego gave a presentation last year at uh, Selenium conference, so you can check out that video. But it looks like a great option for uh, building an in-house Selenium grid that can then take you to the next level. If you don't want to maintain a Selenium grid on your own, you can also uh, use one of the cloud providers. So in our setup, the only difference is that instead of using, instead of using a Selenium grid that's on, a, on our, our Docker network, you'll probably have some little proxy program that's on the Docker network so that when you request access to uh, a, a system that is out in the cloud, then all of those requests will be proxied uh, to, the, um, to the cloud provider's website. All right, so when we first started out uh, our conference, Angie talked about being able to set the goals for, your, for your, uh, your development. One of the goals for our group was to uh, have a test environment that would run in the same way both locally and in Jenkins. We run, we work, the teams that I work with are fairly small, and so 
Uh, we don't really have a lot of time to be doing maintenance on test infrastructure or to be maintaining a test infrastructure. Um, so we decided to go with this route where we where were using the Selenium grid Docker containers. We launch them on our system, and then we can launch them using the same three commands inside of the Jenkins test infrastructure. I've put a template at this uh, URL where you can go and uh, download the template, uh, run the test cases on your own system, there, uh, and, and there are instructions on how to get started, but I think that you guys already know the three commands that you need. <laughs> I'll be at office hours at 1 p.m. if you guys want to talk or see a demo, and thank you for, uh, thank you for attending. <laughs>